This broadcast of OPF Radio on March 4th of 2013 is about If we did this, would they do that? Gary Hunt is the guest, and your host is Sleepy Salsa. And that was Ashley Alicize's A Dangerous Situation. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You are listening to Outpost of Freedom Radio. Are members of the Patriot community discouraged from engaging in particular activities because they anticipate certain consequences would occur if such activities were conducted? We will be looking at what behaviors are discouraged and what the implied consequences would be. Most importantly, what would best serve restoration of constitutional government? With that said, let us turn to our guest. Gary, are you there? I am, Sleepy, and good evening to you. Same to you, sir. Well, recently uh, I was listening to an internet radio show, and they claimed that there were black helicopters over several sh- cities shooting blanks, possibly trying to incite good people to shoot back with real bullets what's the deal here well i was that was brought to my attention as well and yes there were helicopters flying uh numerous helicopters and whether they were black or not i think they're always black when you look at the high contrast of the sky so this has been a problem for uh, a long time even a silver helicopter can look black under the right conditions But uh, they were flying over a number of cities in the country, and and apparently, at least in a couple of cities, they were firing uh, blanks out of machine guns out of the side of the helicopter or mounted guns. I'm not sure which, Uh, but if you go to the videos that were captured of it, you can hear the gunfire and you can see the flashes in some cases. So the event did happen. The, the, The helicopter's flying around in Florida. Uh, Texas and a few other places. I don't remember all the locations, but there were probably five or six. But the the, the story you're talking about is is uh, the suggestion was put out that they're doing this live firing or this uh, firing of blanks with the intention of uh, encouraging people to uh, shoot shoot at them, shoot to try and shoot them down, so they can spin around and shoot the hell out of the people on the ground that are shooting at them, which would be really pretty absurd and it you know it got the uh, some discussions going with myself between myself and some friends including you about uh, this whole thing uh and it's kind of an absurdity because if they turned around and started firing at somebody that was say by his house uh if they're not experienced pilots they're going to be hitting all the houses around there uh a helicopter can be a stable platform in certain situations if you can identify the target but it would be uh it would provoke everybody in the country if they did that and shot up the wrong house and killed somebody uh and besides they'd have to change their ammo feeds as well because if they're firing blanks they got a little bit of work to do before they can fire live rounds unless they uh had blanks and live rounds in the same belt and um you know stopped at 300 rounds and then had the other ones in so it was kind of uh really a, 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 a stupid story, a sensational story. Uh, I don't know how to describe it, but it just did not make sense from a practical standpoint. Well, Gary, why should we take the initiative? Well, the initiative, even in a situation like that, if somebody took a number of shots at the helicopter and then stopped and didn't stand out in the open and they didn't know where it came from, uh, that would put them off guard. Uh, taking the initiative, the plan for restoration of constitutional government is, uh, and I think we can get a link up here in a minute, um, 
re relies on us taking the initiative. Uh, right now, we leave it to them to take the, take the initiative. And I don't think what they were doing was provocative. I think it was more conditioning. Uh, they're trying to get people used to the idea of helicopters flying around and even guns firing because someday it may come into play. But uh, taking the initiative is to our advantage because right now they have the initiative. They know what they're going to do and when they're going to do it. And it is possible they wanted somebody to shoot at them and start firing live rounds, though I doubt it very seriously. But that's the initiative they have. They can start something like that whenever they want to. Uh, I would suggest if they were going to do it, though, that they'd start with live rounds and just fire them out in a remote area and then, uh, uh, you know, see what happens then. But if we take the initiative and start going uh, after them, um, we d really don't want to do it where they're prepared. So where those helicopters are, unless you want to take about you know, 10 or 20 rounds real quick and then boogie, uh, we're better off to take the initiative where they don't expect it, as described in the plan, uh, because that throws them off. They now have to become the reacting force rather than the initiating force. And it goes along with the old theory that the best uh, defense is a good offense. And, you know, I mean, read many instances in history in this country where uh, a, a, sometimes a smaller uh, force that's in a fort will actually uh, leave the fort while the people outside the force, the greater numbers, are getting set up with their artillery uh, and catching them at a disadvantage. So taking the initiative gives us the advantage, and it screws up their plan. That's why we need to take the initiative. If we take the initiative, what should we expect? We would expect for them to scratch their heads and say, what are we going to do next? Uh, they wouldn't know what to do next. They would be at a loss. Um, they're going to react, but let's just say that... Uh, well, there was a, a Matt Bracken did a, a very good fiction story, rather short one, recently, and he was talking about uh, people going out and assassinating the uh, talking heads from television that support the government by lying, deceiving, uh, misrepresenting, and everything else. Uh, so, if uh, say a news reporter that commonly uh, does this type of presentation ended up getting a, a case of uh, lead poisoning, instant lead poisoning, um, the reaction initially would be an investigation, and then they'd have to see what they could do from there. But if you weren't there anymore, you just happened to be there when the incident occurred, the likelihood of them catching you is very slim, especially if you take your brass with you. Um, there's going to be a reaction, but if we if something is is done that's planned uh, and well planned with consideration to the reaction, how long it'll take to react, uh, where we should go to do it, how should we get there, and how should we get back without being detected by uh, traffic cameras and things like that, then the reaction is going to be confusion on their part. Now. You know, the suggestion is always there, and we talked about it in another show. Are they going to declare martial law? Well, if, if that forced them to declare martial law, that would be to our advantage, really, because if they declared martial law in this country and all of these people that go to work every day and come home every day and uh, eat dinner with their children and go over their homework and then watch television, all of a sudden they find out they're un under martial law, they're going to have serious, more serious questions about the government than they do right now, and that would actually push them in our direction. So the reaction, if we used it properly, would be to actually uh, push people in our direction. Uh, so the reaction, if it's not well thought out on their side and is something that can be construed as abusive or um, unacceptable in the eyes of most people, then that reaction is going to uh, be something, especially if we lead into it, something that we expected when we designed the, the effort, the activity in the first place. What does the government have to gain by making patriots fearful of a massive crackdown? 
Uh, what was that Churchill said? The greatest, greatest fear we have is fear itself or the, something like that. Yes. Um, by instilling fear, it discourages activity. And that is a consequence in itself. I mean, the whole gist of what we're talking about tonight is this. If we do something, they're going to do something worse to us. And we don't want something worse to us to happen, so we can't do something to them. Well, <laughs> the end result then is, is called best described as perhaps oblivion because, okay, we can never do anything because they might, might do something back. But wait a minute. We're expecting them to do something back without them doing something in the first place. So why not do something to get them to do something back, especially if we can catch them off guard in their timing and their preparation for doing what we keep saying they're going to do to us. So we've got to sit, uh, uh, consider exactly that. If they instill fear in us, we're going to say we won't do anything because not, we'll, we'll, have, we'll give ourselves a reason to fear because of what they do in return. And so we're allowing fear to become a brick wall against us acting to restore constitutional government in this country. Well, in that case, Gary, why would most of the rest of the alternative media stress the importance of not taking the initiative against the government? Well, let's see. Well, let's look at the different types of the rest of the media. We'll start with uh, Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, the ones that have large sponsors and you know, they've become millionaires by telling stories to people. And like the weathermen and the economic experts, most of the stuff doesn't come true anyway. Uh, they're not, they want your attention. And uh, by you being an advocate of nonviolence, uh, they're actually helping the government because without violence, we will never get this country back. And I think more and more people are realizing that all the time. Uh, so that level, and also they can't get their uh, sponsors upset with them or they'll pull the, uh, uh, the sponsorships and they won't be making their millions of dollars. Uh, then we've got the, the guys that do the weekly shows or daily shows and they've got to have something to talk about. Well, it sounds good. Uh, to, to act like you know what you're talking about. But maybe it's not reasoned out, uh, as we're discussing right now, that, uh, that you're just afraid of something going to happen. Now, we can go back to the 90s, and it was rather interesting. There was a story that came out of Montana, and there's still some people around where, that were advocates of this story or proponents of this story. And um, it was that a, a multi-jurisdictional task force was going to Catherine County, New Mexico, to... Uh, take over the county and impose martial law or whatever they were going to do. Um, but they said yeah, all patriots now, this is Fax Network days, but all the patriots now need to get together and go to the aid of uh, Catron County, New Mexico. Well, wait a minute. Everybody going to the aid of Act, uh, Catron County, New Mexico would be going there with the intention of committing acts of violence against the multi-jurisdictional task force, or they were just going to line the road, wave the flags, and cheer them on. I'm not sure which. I would go with the former. Oh, about a week later, they said, we did it. We scared them away. Now, you wouldn't scare the government away if they were going with a plan like that because the peons on the ground have no choice but to do what they're told, and the people up above put it at risk, so they're going to say, go ahead anyway. And then, you know, but if it, these actions would be justification and the government's looking for justification to start something, that Catron County event would have been perfect for the government. But the same type of stories have been going on for these past 20 years as well. So, uh, and then, of course, the, the next group of alternate media is those, um, I'm going to put it in quotes, researchers who have looked into the matter in great detail, and they have read the same article 30, 16 times and realized this must be true because there's so many postings of it around here that I think I'll write my version of it. And they do this, all of them, without really thinking, I think, of the consequences, except maybe the first ones, Glenn Black and Rush Limbaugh. They know the consequences if they do say something, but the others... Uh, I, I can't really understand the reasoning, but you know when you uh, when you look, like to look at things realistically, and, and you know if there's an action, there's going to be a reaction. Um, what would the action be? What would the reaction be? 
that reaction can't be what is being suggested in, in all these uh, uh, th theories. Uh, may, I made a list of some of the things that I've heard in the last couple of years about what might be a consequence if we did something. And this is going beyond shooting at the helicopters, but if we did something, here are the things that can happen. They're going to declare martial law or a state of emergency and round up dissidents and, and put them in concentration camps. Well, that would be rather interesting because I think that, that if they started rounding people up in any significant numbers, it would really raise concern to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or perhaps millions of people around this country, especially in light of the current uh, resentment of the government's involvement in gun control. I mean, there's people that don't have guns that think this is ridiculous. They know enough about history to know the consequences of gun confiscation, and they realize that gun registration is a step short of uh, confiscation. So that's one, uh, is they're expecting the martial law state of emergency and that's not practical, and, you know, I, I'd refer people back to the previous program we did on martial law to go into detail about the impracticality of the government calling, uh, declaring martial law. Uh, they also, distortion of facts to give false blames. This is, uh, if we shoot at them, uh, I, I don't know quite what they mean with this, but maybe they mean that uh, if patriots shoot at them, they'll claim Al-Qaeda's in the country and, and clamp down because Al-Qaeda's in the country because no good American would ever shoot at helicopters or, or do anything bad in this country. Uh, but they do tend to distort facts, and a good example is Hootery Militia, where the press picked up the banner on that one, and the alternate press and the patriot community picked up the banner. Oh, they're bad people. They're going to shoot cops. So um, there's a bit of demonization that, that could be a consequence, and we've seen that in the past, but that demonization isn't going to change anything. Uh, we're either going to take, uh, take on the, the task of uh, uh, restoring constitutional government or we're not, and that's the, the point. Uh, the other one is enacting gun laws and or gun confiscation. Um, you know, they've been doing this uh, uh, for decades, uh, every time they can, they try and go a little further. Uh, there's all this energy wasted on the internet right now saying, uh, gun registration, we got to do something to stop this and all this stuff that's going on. And then we've got the two camps. We've got sheriffs saying that they'll not l allow the government to enforce gun laws in their jurisdiction, which is bullshit because legally they have to or they're going to get arrested. They'll be deputized, uh, if nothing else, like they were in Waco. Um We've got states passing resolutions saying that these things aren't going to happen. Uh, but, hey, they're happening. They, they, you know, I think Maryland is uh, real close to passing one. I think some states have passed registration or uh, restrictions on magazines. New York has that restriction on magazine sizes. Uh, but they're going to do these anyway, and it's, it's not a consequence of Sandy Hook. It's a consequence of Sandy Hook happened, here's an opportunity to force these uh, regulations out on us by pulling them out of the door, drawer where they've been waiting for an opportunity, blowing the dust off and submitting them. Whether they pass or not, who knows what's going to happen. Quite simply, though, to dispense with uh, the amount of time that's spent on that, being spent on this, what we, all we have to do is, if they require gun registration, don't register your gun. It's simple. Don't tell anybody. Just don't register it. If they try and confiscate your gun, the worst thing you can do, and a lot of people do it on the Internet, is they tell people what their armory is. I've got 27 guns. Here's what they are, and i got silencers, and i got all this. Well, that's giving them an inventory, and it's put you in a, a, a bad way. What you need to do is go online and say, look, I sold all my guns. I don't have any anymore. I'm going with a bow and arrow or a crossbow, so they can't come and confiscate that. Uh, but these laws are going to come anywhere, and they're not a consequence of anything that has been done. If they would have, look at how many opportunities they've had in the last four or five years to enact just Hitler-type gun laws because of the shootings. But what happened out of Sandy Hook is just more blather. They're talking about it. Some are going to pass, and there's going to be some passed in opposition to it. Uh, they 
Next one is, uh, that was number three. Number four is enacting other laws that would be oppressive, including ration cards. Well, when they pass those other laws, they start pushing people again to our side because if they pass ration laws, for example, and ration gasoline, of course their friends will be exempt from the ration. This always happens. Uh, but the, the working man, uh, back in, I think it was 81, there was a gas shortage in this country. It was pretty severe. Uh, I had to go down to Miami from Orlando once, and I didn't know if I was going to get back. Man, I was middle of the night and trying to find an open gas station where I could get enough gas to get back to Orlando. Uh, it was tough. Some gas stations were only allowing their regular customers to buy gas. Uh, but still people got along. But if they did ration cards, that's the limit. Unless you get false ration cards, you only get so many gallons. And if it takes more gallons to go to work, you can't go to work. So if they do something like that, they're going to piss off a whole bunch of people. And those people then are going to start saying those patriots aren't so, uh, or those militia guys or those guys that uh, don't like the government, they're not so out of kilter on things after all. I think I'm going to start listening a little more closely to them. Uh, that was four. Number five, ability to disrupt or eliminate various means of communication, i.e. Internet, phone lines, cell lines, shortwave, etc. Yes, well, I guess there's two types of dependency on, on, on these communication lines. Uh, one is secure communications, and the other one is just communication. Uh, but think, if, if they did it blanketly, we'd have the same consequence from the general population. Maybe even some people on food stamps with their cell phones that couldn't use these free cell phones uh, or Internet connections on computers they got free at our expense would get pissed off because they have no Internet. So if they cut things out, deprive people of what people expect, even if the people are now on their side, they're going to push those people away for, from us. So perhaps that's the best thing that could happen right now is something that would happen that would push those people more towards us. Now, as far as secure communications, uh, if you're using the Internet, phone lines, cell phones, or shortwave, um, everything is interceptable except the hard phone, and that's interceptable uh, by two means. One is the court order, order, or the other one is if you're talking to somebody outside of this country that could be Al-Qaeda or some foreign power interested in uh, problems in this country. So if you don't call out of country and they don't have a, uh, uh, a, a tap warrant, then they can't tap you. Now the question comes up again that, uh, well, they can't tap my cell phone. Um, Years ago, back in 95, I was up in Las Vegas, and a friend of mine had a good scanner. And that good scanner, we were listening to people making drug deals on their cell phones and everything. Cell phones are transmitting a, a, a radio signal that's going 360 degrees around you. And somebody with a receiver can pick that up. If it's scrambled or, or, or locked or something, all they have to do is have the way of getting past that lock. Uh, but that... That's not wiretapping, and it is not included in that. In fact, a uh, veterans magazine today, I read an article that made it very clear that uh, a court in one state where this has been challenged, uh, securing communications, uh, uh, cell phone communications, and using them as evidence in court, the court ruled, and I think we'll find this happening whenever it's brought to a, a judicial challenge, uh, that it, since it goes on the public airways, it's not like in the privacy of your own home with a telephone. Uh, instead, it's more like a radio, and radio signals can't be intercepted. Therefore, there is no protection afforded to cell phone communication. Uh, and then the, I guess the, the best one of all is uh, some people suggest, and I guess this kind of ties in with the helicopter thing, a tactical nuke detonated on a city. Now, it, it might be possible that they could uh, detonate a tactical nuke, let's say in Miami, and then claim that Al-Qaeda did it, but that would really make their security look pretty poor, wouldn't it? It would reflect on the government pretty poorly that they could not protect us from getting a tactical nuclear device emitting radiation as it entered the country by them and detonate it without us finding out. But anyway, those are the cons those are some of the consequences I've heard thrown out uh, when the when it suggested that if we do something, 
they're going to do something back at us. And these are all impractical from a broad standpoint, oh, except gun laws. We do give them um, the opportunity to enact laws, but wait, I said we. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not the same kind of person as Lanza or any of the people in Columbine or anywhere else. They're not patriots. They're not patriots. They do this. The laws get passed. Is it going to be any difference if patriots begin taking selected, not massive, but selected targets out? Might be, but it won't be as much of a stir because they can't say you got to keep them out of the hands of crazy people because they've said that already. Uh, there could be a reaction similar, but if we don't do something, some idiot's going to come and do it again anyway, and then they'll pass some more gun laws. And we're not doing anything because we're afraid if we do something, they'll pass some more gun laws. So no matter how you cut it, we're going to get new gun laws. Accept it. Just don't abide by it. So that's the list of things that could happen to us if we were. The one I mentioned earlier on, too, of course, is the helicopter shooting back if somebody shoots at the helicopters. But that's the uh, would they do that part of the program. If we did this, would they do that? These are the things that have been speculated would happen to us. There may be more if we think of them during the show. We'll bring them up, up too. So, Gary, I think what you, that uh, half dozen or so uh, list I think you just gave us, I think are just examples of what a massive government crackdown could entail. Everything from the, you know, the roundup of dissidents to the more gun-related stuff to even uh, the tactical nuke. So I, I guess then the next really let me, more... Let me clarify something here. Uh, you said something that they could do. Now, I think I've been pointing out the impracticality of them even doing it. I don't think we can expect that kind of reaction. I think that's the point here, that we have to understand that it would be stupid to do any of these things, for the government to do any of these things on a broad scale. What they want to do is pick off individuals that are bad guys, whether it be Lanza or some militia member that shoots somebody. If the militia member is smarter than Lanza, he won't get caught. Uh, I stand corrected. Well, then I guess then the $64,000 question, I guess, would be then, are patriots fooling themselves by being afraid of a crackdown of some kind, either the stuff you've listed or other versions on the theme of them? Uh you know, I'm a surveyor, and so mapping was part of this. And I, I remember years ago, I used to look for stuff to be humorous to start my classes when I taught surveying. And I think one of the best ones is uh, some of these old maps showing the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean and Europe and Africa. And out somewhere off the coast of Europe and Africa, they would draw sea monsters, and there would be a notation, there be monsters here. And because there be monsters here, nobody wanted to venture there because there were monsters there. Um, we are creating our own monsters. We are creating a fiction. These six things that we mentioned are the seven counting the helicopters fighting back. And there are more. By expecting that reaction if we do it and saying, I'm not going to do it because that will be the reaction, I have created a monster for the sole purpose of scaring myself from venturing west to the new world. So, well, yeah, they are fooling themselves. Well, if that's the case then, Gary, then how can the patriots overcome the fear of a massive crackdown? Well, if the patriots want to restore the country, they're going to have to realize one thing. When this battle begins, they may never see their family again. That's something that every soldier that goes overseas in combat from, uh, you know, for living people, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and all these many wars we've had since then, when you go over there, you might not come home. You might come home in a body bag. Your family gets the flag. Um How did they overcome the fear? They recognized a responsibility. They made a co commitment to that responsibility, and they pursued the objective that was set before them. 
Uh, how do we overcome the fear of a mass crackdown? It is not a consequence. Uh, there's an old theory that in war, what you got to do, and I think this came out of World War II, first you consider yourself dead already. And then if you're lucky enough to survive, then you beat the odds. But you have to get fear out of the way. The worst thing in combat is fear. It's liable to get you killed. It's got liable to get other people killed. An organized retreat versus a chaotic retreat. Chaotic retreat, guys are shot in the back. In the uh, organized retreat or withdrawal, uh, you step back. Uh, in groups and you keep uh, the rear guard firing at the enemy slowing down the enemy but when you turn your back on the enemy man they're shooting you in the back and they're running after you as fast as you're running away from them or faster so um, the fear of a massive crackdown is inconsequential if we want our country back we have to accept that there will be consequences to our actions actions. The way I see it, a massive crackdown would be to our advantage because a massive crackdown isn't going to affect just me and you. It's going to affect the people down the street that don't have an idea what's going on. They just wonder what the hell's going on in the news because everything's going to hell. So the massive crackdown will get him to come down the road, talk to me and say, what is going on? And maybe he'll have a little more open mind than he did when he voted for the bastard president. But to dispel that, have to get rid of the fear. It, it, it's inconsequential. It's bullshit. You're just finding an excuse to keep you from doing something. And it's, hey, when you want an, an excuse, is good enough. That's a good one. You want another one? Well, I want to make sure I always come home to my family. Uh, that's a good one. Ain't no sense in taking risk if you want to do that. In fact, maybe you ought to stop driving. Um, it's an excuse. That's all there is. Get rid of it. It's a ghost. It's a monster. Look. Well, well, Gary, if, if we're he hearing you right, uh, you, you're, it sounds like you're suggesting that the fear of a massive, or that the actual massive crackdown itself, a potential one anyway, it, at worst, would really just be a blessing in disguise. Well, I would see it as such, yes. I think it would be a blessing. Uh, but see, that's, that's where we get back to this... Uh, uh, tactics. Right now, they've got the initiative, and they've got us scared, and, and they've got us scared because they probably plant the seeds that this might happen, this that might happen, and then people pick up the banner, this might happen, that might, that might happen, then more pick up the banner, and right that now, they have forced us back into a corner, and we're willingly sitting in that corner because something might happen. Um, All right, well, let's get more into the meat and potatoes of this then. So if, if aggress aggressive actions were taken and the actors were caught by the government, would there be enough popular support so as to increase the probability of jury nullification? Oh, that is a rather complex question, so we'll go a step at a time. Some friends of mine shot a cop. The cop started to draw his gun on George. Uh, in the line of John Bad Elk, he defended himself. His wife defended him. They killed the cop. Um, it would have been nice. This is back in uh, 94 it would, or 93. It would have been nice if we could have gotten a, a large number of people to go break them out of jail or prison or wherever they were. It'd be nice if we get patriots out. More recently, there's a guy named Charles Dyer that's in prison. A lot of people think he's not guilty of what he was charged with, that it was a setup, and it very possibly was. But we come to that question now is how many lives do we want to invest in getting somebody out of the circumstances that they found themselves in, whether they're th through their own actions, their own inactions, or because they were targeted by government? Uh, by the same reason, uh, reason, jury nullification, there's a guy in jail in Florida right now, and I think he's serving 15 months for contempt of court because he was at, passing out jury nullification literature. If there were a massive crackdown, I think we would be more likely to find these people that live down the street from us willing to be a little more receptive about the whole concept of fully informed jury association, FIJA, uh, than they are now. But right now, they honestly believe that if the judge says, if that guy tied his shoes, 
backwards that day, you must find him guilty, they will find him guilty. So jury nullification is not a way out. The only way out is if somebody's important enough, perhaps risking lives to get him out, or until the, the time comes that the, the plan itself calls for breaking, taking over that prison and, and releasing those prim- prisoners that would be um, on our side, uh, the, the person's a casualty of war. The difference is he's alive, he was dead, and I think Randy Mack used to use this. Uh, nobody went to save uh, Nathan Hale when he was hung for spying. Uh, that's a casualty of war. They perhaps could have gone in and released him and risked a bunch of lives. Uh, there are a lot of things they could have done. But if somebody gets taken out, they're a casualty of war. They're dead. Now, if they're still alive and you finally get to the point that it's not an additional risk to secure their safety or uh, release, then they're back, they come back to life. But we can't look at the fact that um, if somebody were caught doing these actions, that, that, that they could expect anything more than just sympathy from the Patriot community. Well, would it be better to take the initiative in areas that are already friendly to the Patriot community? Or would it be better to perform such actions in enemy or even neutral territory? Both. (laughs) Uh, In fact, all three. (laughs) Neutral territory, friendly territory, or enemy territory. Uh, If you do it in friendly territory, uh, what's the effect? Uh, It might not get past the local news. And, you know, face it, the attention that comes to something like this, some acts, uh, if you knew how many bombings really go on in this country, how many bank robberies, uh, uh, how many killings of cops, things like that go on in this country, uh, killing cops, for example, you should see on an average three or four a day, but you don't. Um, Bombs going off, probably five or six a week go off in this country, and you don't hear about them unless you live locally. Uh, we don't hear about things. They're, they're contained by the press. These guys are players for the government. Face it. If you do it in a patriot community, it, its effect should be one that provides a, a distinct benefit to that community. For example, getting rid of somebody that has some authority that is, is a problem, a thorn in the side of the patriot community. If you do it in neutral territory, then you're more likely to get the attention because a broader number of people are going to be aware of it. Um, depending on, on what it is, uh, if it's planned well, it would probably garner sympathy if the word gets out far enough, but it might be contained within that area. However, if you go in the enemy's territory and do something, it's going to get attention, which is what you want, believe it or not. Just like, uh, when uh, Burgoyne was captured uh, in uh, during the Revolutionary War, that attention got France on our side. It's good to have attention when you do something successfully. The consequences of getting caught, obviously it's safer at home, though not as effective. In neutral territory, there's probably a greater risk. And in an enemy territory, if you plan it right, there is probably no risk at all because they don't expect you to be there. So it's your planning is is the whole factor in the safety of the uh, action that you intend to pursue. It has uh, the the three things you've got to consider. Is the target a good one that we can justify by one means or another? And now people say, well, you'll never be able to do that. But uh, a couple links got posted a few minutes ago, press in the Patriot community and the press in Waco. Uh, Yes, the press can be swayed. They were swayed in both cases. Those give some examples of, of what where we've been successful in getting word out uh, through the mainstream media because they want a story, and they want an exclusive. And if they get something, they'll come out with it. It might not go all over the country, but it will go to on a broader base locally if, if you get the story out. Um, the preparation uh, or the, the identification of targets, something that can be uh, presented in a, a good light for the Patriot community because of the evil of that. 
uh, the planning that goes into the exercise. Okay, you got to know where you're going, when when you're going to do it. Um, I, I, I believe in Tim McVeigh. Uh, he did something differently than I would. I've said this for the last uh, uh, 18 years. If I were doing that, I would have done it at night. But I'm not going to condemn Timothy McVeigh for doing it when people were in the building. Um, he went after a government building. He has killed people in the name of the government already. And he wanted the government to have a, or the American people to have a taste of what it's like to be on the receiving end of the power of the military forces we deploy around the world. If he had planned it better, he might not have gotten caught. Uh, two things in planning. One is to escape, and two is to be able to escape even further if you are found out because you haven't prepared properly and left some evidence that directs towards you. Um, Where you do something, again, back to if you do it locally, you're probably doing it in your community. If you travel two or 300 miles and figure out how to do that, and it's not hard to figure out how to do that without being identified with the roadside cameras. Now, they have cameras now that actually read license plates, can read ten to 20,000 license plates a day. Uh, they're a different sort of camera than the original ones. The ones I've seen are longer. They're about six or eight inches long. They're about a one-and-a-half to two-inch diameter tube. Uh, those they are infrared, and like face recognition, they have license plate recognition. It identifies the rectangle and then read, reads the numbers. Uh, so planning for that, finding some material that will not allow the heat through, like mylar, a reflective mylar surface or something like that that you can see through, but the infrared can't see through. Um, maybe painting your your vehicle, uh, even with water salt, if it's not going to rain. Uh, water soluble paint so that it's a different color. Whatever is necessary, take, taking back roads, making sure you don't buy, go by cameras, and traveling a great distance, uh, committing your act, and then leaving. You leave no pointer. Now, if I go 300 miles and do something, the search radius for the perpetrators would one would have to get up to 300 miles to bring me into the net to begin with now at 300 miles we're talking about uh 30,000 square miles we're talking about a pretty substantial search area so the further you go the less likelihood as long as you don't leave a calling card uh of evidence so it's almost safer to go that distance because you are outside of the initial web, you know, the first thing to do. Uh, uh, stop the planes, the trains, the buses, and, and the interstates. But there's always back roads. Uh, but their, their first reaction when something happens is to uh, try and contain that within an area. Well, look what happened in California recently with that uh, cop Dorner. You know, they, all the roads in and out of Big Bear were well, well guarded. People were being stopped for the half minute to a minute, the line was backed up over three miles. Even after they were told to get out of town, they had to wait three miles, uh, five hours to get out of town. So the first effort is going to be to try and contain it within an area. And you've got to make sure you get out of that area within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, but the planning, there's a Molan Law by Boston Tea Party. Uh, it's available on the Internet. And he talks about... Uh, one person in there that that does some planning, and it's worth reading. The guy found out th what this guy's schedule was, what his habits were, uh, how he could, uh, uh, where he could uh, take advantage of the situation, what he was going to do when he got the guy, uh, and uh, everything to make sure that he did not leave a trail. So it's worth reading that book just for that sole purpose to get an idea of how something like this could be planned. There's another one called Unintended Consequences that isn't as detailed, but it shows, again, that uh, if it's properly planned, the likelihood of getting caught becomes less and less. Well, Gary, how much preparation is realistic before taking the initiative, especially in terms of time? Well, I would say that 
six months would be enough in almost any situation and some may be a lot less. It depends on what the plan is, but the preparation has to be there. And so if you're not willing to do something now, I'll tell you what, play a game. This is called uh, role RPGs. Play a game, pick a target, scope it out, develop your plan, work on your plan. Just, hey, this is role playing game. Work on the plan. See if you can come up with a plan that is undetectable. And that way, if the time comes that you decide you're going to act, all you got to do is review your plan, make sure everything's still the same, and then carry out your plan. How much preparation is dependent upon how much time you put into it and especially how much thought you put into it. Does it take a long time? Not necessarily. But I would say that safely, in some cases, it might be up to six months. But in many other cases, it might be as little as two or three or four weeks. But at least, probably in most cases, at least a month to make sure that everything was going to fit right. That uh, the target Now, if it's a stationary target, that's different. I'm, I'm thinking of a... a a moving target, somebody that works for a living or something like that. If it's a stationary target, uh, less time. You just have to scope it out, find out when, how often the police go by, You know, see if you can find some patterns that allow you uh, a period of time where there's less uh, a time of day and everything where there's less risk uh, created while you're on the scene. Um, one that uh, is used over and over again, unless they change things, though, it, it, and back to this, you have to make sure that you know where the cameras are and how you're going to defeat the cameras. There is another thing to consider. If your car has GPS in it, more than likely it sends a signal out and can be identified. Uh, I would suggest finding out where the uh, uh, power supply for that GPS is and, and pulling that fuse. Uh, if you have a cell phone, don't take it with you. Uh, best thing might be to take it over to a friend who's going to be your alibi, take your phone over to his house and leave it there and then go on your mission, then come back to his house and you can prove that you were there the whole time. Maybe even have him make a phone call or two to a, a number that nobody's going to answer so the cell phone will uh, logs will show the location and the call was made and nobody answered. Uh, you know, d diversion is a, a tactic that can go into planning quite easily and should be considered in all cases. But don't make the mistake of taking your cell phone. Don't make the mistake of leaving the power on in the GPS in your car. Uh, you know, think about how you might be able to be caught. And this is the planning. Uh, do what you can to avoid creating any risk along those lines. By if you're not sure, then don't do it. If you're not sure that you're safe, then take the, the side that, protects you that's safest for you does an elaborate support structure including but not limited to an underground railroad need to be established first well the support structure um in the plan i talk about that and there's been some discussions especially after i wrote the plan that people said well you can't make that decision yourself you're a judge jury and executioner you need to have some other people come in and 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 help you decide if it's a good target and and all this other stuff well yes right let's bring somebody in who's not at risk in fact if he has any risk is prior knowledge of it uh... the best thing he can do if he's picked up is to spill the beans because then he has uh, aided the government and probably avoid the prior knowledge charge altogether. I think this has probably happened in a number of cases in the Patriot community. Uh, I think of Joe Sims, for example, and I think of uh, the informant in the uh, the Schaefer Cox deal. Um, sometimes one individual gets out by being informed. So the only people that need to know about this are the people that are actually going to participate in the activity. Now, as far as the support group outside of that, we've talked about security teams, and there's a, uh, a radio show uh, uh, at OPF Radio that discusses this. Um, and in that, I explained that our security team did not ask questions. Uh, they did what they were asked by a member of the security team. They had full faith uh, when I asked them to... Uh, do something that uh, and told them it was necessary. They didn't ask me why. So uh, if you have a security team, you've got that initial step. Uh, 
And it might be the guy that lets the cell phone come to your, his house. You don't have to tell him what you're doing. Just say, look, I want to bring my cell phone to your house. I want to leave it there. And maybe about 10 o'clock, I want you to make a phone call to somebody's house that you know is not home. And uh, uh, then just hang the phone up and put it back down until I get back. And don't ask any questions, okay? Yeah, okay, that's the first step. Underground Railroad. Ah. Uh, I did a radio show with uh, Freebird once on Underground Railroads, and I think the people who listened to that show realized that trying to set, an OPF, uh, to, to set up an Underground Railroad ahead of time is about the most dangerous thing that you can possibly do. The RAM site had people giving their name, address, phone number, what position, whether they were going to be conductors or safe houses and all this, on the Internet of all places. Now, those However many people, 500 people signed up for that Underground Railroad, don't ever go to their house if you're trying to hide because they have, big, they, have they are on a list. Who knows? The government might even think if they're real to, to put uh, uh, audio or visual equipment in the neighborhood watching their house. I mean, that's stupid. But let's go back to where uh, people were hidden from the government quite effectively. The first one was... Peter Chernoff, Linda Issel, and Peter's son, Alex, they came to my office, um, I think around the 12th of February, I don't remember the exact date, but it was mid-February, and uh, we hid them uh, until after Waco, after Waco, Linda wanted to go back to California, so uh, I went, we, we went I, I drove her back to California. Peter and Alex were still being uh, holed up, and they didn't come out of being hidden by an underground railroad station because there was no... This is the security team again, too, and some of the members never knew that we were doing it. But we, we kept him away from the government for um, nearly five months w until Peter decided that he was going to turn himself in. So we could have gone forever. The other one, shortly after that, was a guy named Paul Fada, and this was the next month uh, in March uh, that Paul Fada first went back to Waco and said, I, I'm one of the Davidians. I want to talk to my friends in there. And, oh, get out of here. We're not letting anybody talk to him. So Paul left. Later, they issued a warrant for Paul Fada because he was one of the ones that was going to gun shows and selling firearms. And even rumors came out that he had an FFL license, but my understanding in talking with the Davidians is he never had an FFL license. But he was hidden, and I met some of the people that hid him up in Washington, in Oregon and Idaho. And they same thing. It came up, the need. He went to somebody he knew and trusted up in Oregon. He said, can you hide me? And so he was kept in Oregon now. Uh, and, but, however, like with Peter Chernoff, Peter Chernoff came to my office. That night, we got him to another location in case my office was uh, watched, because if Peter figured out I might, and I'd never met Peter before, if he figured out that I might be a place to go, then the government might. And actually, they did come eventually looking for him at, but, uh, and interviewed me, but uh, to no avail to them. The same thing uh, in Oregon. Uh, he went, as I understand it, from Oregon into Washington and then to Idaho. So where he went initially might be a definable pattern. So then he was passed on. So the railroad laid down the tracks and built itself when the need arose. It wasn't preconditioned underground railroad. That's the dumbest thing you can do. One person in that railroad's compromised, and the whole railroad's compromised, or anybody that that one person knows about is potentially compromised. However, if you deal with people that you have implicit trust in, whether they're in the next state, no matter, or they're in your security team, they will know somebody, and they will know somebody, and they will know somebody, and you can create this railroad at the time. So as far as reestablishing an underground railroad, I would say absolutely not. But having a security team or some uh, whatever you call it or just some people that you have implicit trust in that could hide you for a few days until other arrangements could be make, made would be good. But they don't need to know about it until the need arises, uh, kind of like an intelligence, the need to know. Uh, so. The support structure doesn't have to be elaborate. It has to be thought out. It has to be trustworthy, and it has to be 
uh, viable and, uh, and able to expand as necessary as, as the circumstances allow. Because if something happens and you find out they're looking for you, that's the time that you need to disappear. And that's the time, too, that you need to make, uh, uh, disappear to somewhere that they wouldn't expect. You don't want to go to uh, a friend in Billings, Montana, because you go visit him every couple of years or he comes to see you because they're going to look in Billings. So you h- use this chain of friendship who have somebody in uh, 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 Great Falls, Idaho, that uh, and go there where you've never been and you don't have any friends there. Uh, because the government knows who your friends are if you don't leave, look on Facebook. Um, they do, the government does a lot of profiling. And uh, they have some software, and I've seen uh, captures of the images. Uh, your chain of friends shows there. Your closest friends are probably your worst enemies if you're going to hide out. Keep that in mind. Unless it's that initial step. But no, they don't have to be elaborate support structures, but they need to be thought out and expandable, but don't expand them until you need to. All right, then. Well, we're going to go to break, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, so grab a cup of coffee or lie back, sit back, grab your favorite type of drink, and we will be back momentarily. Good Talk Radio takes a lot of effort to make it successful. Aren't you tired of the self-made pundits yammering about the same old dozen topics again and again for years on end? Don't you wish they'd cover some new subjects as well as spend more time on things that can actually help you restore your liberties? Would you prefer a new voice in the alternative media that actually puts out quality information instead of just trying to fill airtime? If so, please consider making a donation to OPF Radio today. We are completely independent media who are entirely supported by our listeners. So we are not beholden to either corporate special interests or unscrupulous advertisers who would use us to push their products, however useless they may be to you. It is truly a labor of love to bring high-quality episodes of OPF Radio to your digital music player. However, we do need to meet our operating expenses. If you believe in our mission to bring original and useful material to the Patriot community, please consider making a donation today. No amount is too small, and every dollar is appreciated. Thank you so much for making this outreach effort worthwhile for all of us. And that was The Patriots by IHM. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to this broadcast of Outpost of Freedom Radio. Uh, Tonight we are discussing if they do this, will they do that? All right, Gary. So is it likely that some alternative media outlets will be supportive of such actions that take the initiative, thus helping to win more hearts and minds in the information war? Well, I think that a lot of the uh, alternative media uh, will, once they get a, a decent picture of what's happening and find out the helicopters aren't shooting back, will become very positive for, for what's happening. 
perhaps not. You know, something that I've called the the McVeigh syndrome for a long time. I mean, people wanted to accuse McVeigh of being a government agent, but I think if it's, uh, I think what's important uh, is that when an act like this is carried out indirectly, somebody like myself who believe this should happen and believe that it must happen. Uh, I don't want to hear directly from the players, the actors in it. I don't want to hear indirectly from them. I want that to go as far as possible to keep me from knowing, having any idea who it is. But I want to know the target, why they pick the target, things like that, things that would be interesting, a story could be built around. Now, once that story goes out that we can hang our hat on, then we can expect that the perhaps some of these guys that say Tim McVeigh's a government agent will say, well, this was conducted for this reason and start supporting the story, and that will go out to broader uh, levels of the alternate media uh, when they realize that maybe a ball is going to get rolling, which is what Tim McVeigh was trying to do. And I will. And we had two links up there a while ago. Maybe we can put them back up, uh, Preston Waco and, and uh, uh, Preston the Patriot Community, that uh, we might even get um, some mainstream media to at least ask some questions that bring the other side of the story up to the uh, through the mainstream media. So I think we can get support if it's done right. But the pr- thing is, we have to know the target has to be one that's justifiable. Number one, if you read the plan, it talks a lot about that. Whether it be an individual or an object, you, it has to be justifiable, and that justification has to be gotten out to the uh, the the trustworthy patriot media and it cannot come directly from you if it does come directly from you i would do everything that i could to keep to break that chain uh but there's no guarantee there it needs to come by direct uh, indirect means um you know find somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody that knows me um it's better if the chain's broken at least by one hand carry from one place to another uh Whatever has to be done to break the chain, uh, that it can't be tracked by the government. Uh, once the story can be written in a positive manner, identifying the cause, why it happened, uh, then it has, uh, depending on how well that's done, it has the potential of going all the way out to mainstream media in a rather positive or at least an accept, uh, acceptable uh, presentation. All right. Now, before I forget, we are taking questions at this time. The call in number is area code 530-576-5790. Again, that is 530-576-5790. Alternatively, you can pose your questions in the listener chat room, and they will be addressed on the air. And while we wait for those lovely questions and comments from the audience, Gary, wouldn't the, uh, now to play devil's advocate a little bit here, wouldn't the government just simply infiltrate those involved with taking the initiative and somehow sabotage them? Well, they would definitely try, and I think I, I, to some degree I addressed that. Uh, we've got two links, uh, four and five. Um, if you're care planning and you don't bring anybody in that's not going to be a player in it, uh, it would make it very difficult to infiltrate. And so y- your security uh, is the, the smallness of your group, the fact that you're taking total responsibility, you're not looking for some higher authority. We're not the committees of safety where you've got a civil body that you've got to answer to because when you bring them in, you put them at risk, and if they're at risk, they're going to dump you to save their own neck. So to avoid infiltration, it should be people that you've known and trusted for a long time and that you are extremely comfortable with because for all intents and purposes, their life is in your hands. Now, the government will try and infiltrate if they have any idea who's doing it, what's happening, because they have to get evidence before they can try you. Uh, they haven't gone to, some people contest this, they haven't gone to direct assassination of Americans uh, yet. They have gone to direct murder of people under certain circumstances, but not direct assass- assassination. So uh, to avoid infiltration, 
uh, I think Vortex needs to be considered here too. Uh, uh, so the link to Vortex. But to avoid in- infiltration, uh, make yourself uninfiltratable. That's what's important. All right. Now, is there anything that can realistically be done to discourage participants in such actions from, let's say, copping out prior to an action? Well, shall we call it a blood oath? Um, No, you have to know that the people that you're going to be uh, working with uh, are reliable and will not uh, back out. Um, Liberty, freedom is something highly valued in God's eyes, so he puts a high price on it. That's a paraphrase from Thomas Paine. The uh, Marquis in France during World War II, if they had suspicions that somebody in their group was on the wrong side, they got rid of that person. Now, what what their procedure was for the determination, uh, and you can always be, you know, actually an infiltrator could get a good guy taken out if he worked right. But we talked about this in the uh, security team program uh, that uh, when we were moving to a, a, a meeting place and somebody wanted to go make a phone call or call his wife or anything that, he was disposed of. It's once they're in, they're in. You, there's no way out. You're part of it. Uh, that's the only thing is for everybody that's playing to know that once we start this action, once we begin driving to the objective, uh, the game's on and nobody gets out. Now, if anybody calls, uh, wants to quit before then, I think that prudence dictates that you abandon the plan and dispense with that guy. And if you can come up with another plan uh, with the same ones that you're already working with, less that one, or if you need one more body and and can find somebody and bring him in. uh, So your point of no return is when you begin to drive away to do the the job. Um, If the guy is going to turn you in before you start the job, there's, you won't know it until the police come to arrest you. And then I suggest to everybody say, well, it was his idea in the first place, the, the informant. But, you, you know, caution, that's the name of the game. No matter what it is, if you think you're going against a smaller force and it's a bigger force, it's one of those oh shit moments. Should such initiative taking be done in a couple of sensational activities, or would it be better as, say, a long series of smaller activities? Yes and yes. Uh, Sensational activities are going to get more attention. We discussed that earlier. If it's local and patriot controlled area, like, you know, play part of most of Idaho or places of most of Montana is not going to get the attention. So the more sensational, the more coverage is likely to get. Repetition is good too, because a, a similar pattern occurs in different places around the country. That's going to get attention. They don't call them serial killers because they only killed one person. They call them serial killers and they get branded as such. And it gets national news when they killed a bunch of people. Likewise, if you're going to the, the more that happens and the more sensational some of those are, the more uh, you're going to, uh, to get attention. And one of the purposes, there's two purposes, two objectives. One is you want the attention of people, and you want it to be in a good light. You've got to bring the people that are in the middle closer to our side or, or all the way over and, and very supportive. Uh, the other one, and... I haven't mentioned it yet, but perhaps the most important one is right now, uh, this whole discussion is predicated on us fearing them. If we do something, they're going to do something back. We live in fear. We have created that fear by creating the monsters. We live in fear of what they're going to do to us. What happens when that fear turns around? What happens when they start fearing? So probably psychologically, uh, let's look at it this way. Uh, I did an interview with John a long time ago, back in the 90s, about popping cops. Uh, you can do a 
search for popping cops, uh, and you'll find the article. Uh, what would happen if pop, uh, cops, especially abusive ones, uh, ones that uh, you, you've, you know from uh, press reports or uh, YouTube videos, these people are abusive. They slam people on the ground. They do all kinds of abusive stuff. What, ha- what would happen if those guys started getting instant cases of blood poisoning? Well, at first, there wouldn't be much reaction. There'd be a little sympathy, a big parade. They'd call all the cops off duty and pay them overtime to go to the funeral and the memorial service and all that. But as it happens more and more, these guys are going to start thinking. I mean, (laughs) officer safety has become principal now when no matter what the... Uh, Columbine shooting, officer safety. Let's get all the officers here. The theater in Colorado, uh, get all the officers here before we go in. The uh, Sandy Hook, get all the officers here. Officer safety is very important. So they're concerned about their own safety. But that's on the job when they're facing one or two people, and they want to have 30 guys outside in military body armor with uh, full automatic weapons, uh, flashbangs, tear gas, and everything else. What happens, though, when they fear just being a cop might have consequences that go beyond officer safety? In fact, they are the exact opposite uh, of officer safety. We put the fear in them, the psychological advantage to our side. How many guys are going to say, well, let's see, uh, I like going home to my wife and and children at night. Uh, I think I'm going to look for another job. So if we can turn that fear around on them and not create fear and throw it on ourselves, perhaps uh, between both the alternate media and perhaps mainstream media and putting fear in them, that we will rattle the government's cage even more. If they go from a million-man police force down to an 800,000-man police force because 200,000 cops uh, or or other people in, in law enforcement positions decided to resign, They've diminished their force by 20%. That's pretty good for us. If we can diminish their force by 20%, that's really going to screw up their plans because they they had planned on using a certain amount of people, and that's reduced by 20. That has a a, a consequence on them. So there's things that we can do whether sensational or repetitive, that will have the same effect. So now, if there are smaller activities, they shouldn't be close to you. Uh, It it would be better if uh, this group in in Washington did something, then a group in Arizona did something, then a group in Kentucky did something. So, And this goes back to the concept behind the plan. These are happening all over the country. They don't even know where to put their resources to investigate these events. If they all happen within 300 miles of where you live, they given you, 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 they concentrate their force in that 300 miles. If they're happening all over the country, they've got to split their force and send them out to investigate in all these locations. And so, if you do, if they're happening all over the country and they're uh, happening a great distance from the actor's lo- real location. Uh, They're effective, whether they're sensational or they're small. Small requires greater numbers than sensational, obviously, to get the attention. So it doesn't matter which, and that factor should be one uh, when you're doing the planning regarding the risk that you're creating or being able to remove from the activity, um, the accessibility, and all these other things. So... But nobody, no group should go out and do one this week and one next week and one the week after that. I mean, that, that brings everybody down on you. That, uh... We've actually got, uh, I guess it's a combination of a question and a comment. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, kind of summarize it. Remember the D.C. snipers and how much fear they instilled? That was an attack on citizens. What if they do that again? Uh, Those D.C. snipers were highly effective at shutting down a huge geographic area for a few weeks. Um, And there was kind of an additional comment about this is kind of different from the Dorner issue where the the LAPD went apeshit on Dorner and went total Nazi. 
Well, uh, let's let's go to DC Sniper first. They kept doing the same thing in the same area over and over again, and the risk was very great. And I guess some cops saw a rifle sticking out of the back of a car that matched the description that might have been a car that was seen at a number of locations, and so they busted the guys. They were stupid. They didn't plan. Uh, I don't think they went more than ten miles. I, I don't recall now from you know the ten mile radius or maybe a twenty mile radius that everything was done within there. And I don't know how many shootings they did, but they brought they became a magnet. They 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 were dumb. Uh, yes, but it did put cops in fear, and that's the whole idea. But it doesn't matter if it's one area or all over. That got cops in f- uh, fear there. But if if as many cops have been killed all over uh, instead of citizens there. Uh, uh, you know, if they killed 20 people, if 20 cops died within a period of one week all over the country and all in very suspicious circumstances, not a gunfight or anything like that, it might get attention next week when 20 more occur. Sooner or later, that's going to get the attention, spark the attention that is necessary. Now, Dorner, it's kind of interesting because uh, you saw the consequences of fear in that. And, and this be, perhaps quite well demonstrates what I'm talking about. Huh. Two Chinese or Japanese ladies delivering newspapers got shot because these cops were so scared they could not think straight. The truck was not the same type. It was not the same color. And one lady's throwing papers out of it. And they shoot her up. Now then gunfire is reported in that vicinity, which is where apparently one of the targeted cops live. And a block or two away, a guy in a truck that doesn't match the truck, doesn't match, uh, it's dark, uh, they ram him and shoot the truck, but they can't even hit the guy. And this happened within minutes of each other. They were so scared, it was unbelievable. If that fear went on long enough, I would guess that guys would say, well, I think it's time for me to find another job. I think I'll be a, a security guard at a warehouse where it's safe. Uh, that's the whole idea behind popping cops. You do create fear in them eventually, and when it becomes great enough, then they will uh, cower from it, especially if, now, in the Dorner case, they had a target. They had Dorner ID. You know, They knew who they were looking for. They knew what his car looked like. Uh, now, remember the car that you saw pulled out of uh, the woods up by Big Bear didn't match the two cars that were shot up, but... Uh, so the Dorner does does show the reaction, overreaction, and fear. Uh, keeping your cool uh, in any circumstance is stressful. Gives you a much greater chance of survival. I mean, these guys just went haywire uh, to the point that they decided. You know, uh, uh, San Bernardino County allowed finally allowed LA PD to come in or LA sheriffs to come in and execute Dorner. Uh, they wanted to discourage sub, uh, future activity along that line. But so both cases did put fear in cops. Uh, uh, the cops were even afraid, uh, probably more than the people in the Washington, D.C. Uh, thing. Uh, but fear, uh, w- when there's a possibility it could happen to you, fear arises. Um, many years ago, there was some poison put in a. Tylenol bottle up in Washington State, I think, and everybody was taking their Tylenol back uh, bottles back to the druggist, demanding their money back and buying bare aspirin because of the fear. So fear is a uh, it's a useful tool for our side. I wrote a, an article, Fear and Escalation, Escalation and Fear, and I don't know if it's on the link list, but I think uh, our link guy can find it. Um, it's in the uh, Oklahoma City stuff. But what happened during the Oklahoma City is Michael Hill probably died because fear that the uh, Patriot Ball uh, for restoration of constitutional government had begun. Uh, there's a, there was a uh, notice to all law enforcement officers that went out. There's a copy of that notice in the article. Um, Cops were scared all over the country. So the cop that uh, stopped Michael Hill was scared shitless. And these other cops rolled on the scene. And this is what, uh, you know, if you read The Death of Michael Hill, you'll see, uh, which is on my pages, uh, you'll see what the evidence is to support this, where the body was found, where the blood, 
the brain matter was found, uh, the blood splatters, uh, some autopsy show, uh, pictures showing uh, bullet entry wounds. It could not have happened the way the cop described it. And it appears the second cop's rolling. This is a few months after Oklahoma City bombing, by the way. And this, this law, notice to all law enforcement had gone out. The second team rolls on the team, and, and Mike Hill probably rolled just a little bit, and this one cop got scared and shot him. With the second cop, to, uh, second and third cops to roll in the scene, but they lied about the whole thing. In fact, they even tried to set it up to make it look like all the shots came from the first confrontation. But they couldn't have. And when you look at the, like I say, the look at the pictures you'll, and read the the explanation, you'll see it couldn't have happened. So Oklahoma City put fear in not cops specifically, but government general. Uh, they were afraid the war had begun, and they were getting shook up, to say the least. And it cost Michael Hill his life. He's a casualty of that war, even though the war hasn't started. Um, okay, well, does the training of these teams require some sort of, say, pre-qualification before they are eligible to participate in actual operations? <laughs> uh Everybody's dumb, and that's why the cops are in charge, because we're, we're, most people assume that they're dumb and only the cops can handle it. Uh, you know, I don't know how many million miles of crime scene tape there are in this country. If crime happens in another country, people go in and help out. But in this free country that we live in, they put up the crime scene tape because they're the only ones qualified. The government tries to enhance that position by leaking out a little, in, uh, giving out and leaking out a little information just enough to create confusion over any incident that occurs. And, you know, we saw that in Sandy Hook with a multitude of stories that came out, or Oklahoma City or anything else. Um, the pre-qualification is think it out. Walk through it in your mind. Discuss it with the players that are going to be working with you. And, and think it out. You don't need special training. If you've got special training, it's an enhancement. But if you work out your plan well enough, and think of all the uh, possibilities, all the things that might occur. Suppose you're stopped on the way there. What do you do then? Well, more than likely, if you're stopped for speeding or something, you did something pretty damn stupid, and you ought to call it off and, and regroup and do it again, and next time, don't speed. Uh, so, you know, until you actually perform the act, you're not committed. But thinking it out. For example, finding the cameras, thinking about your cell phone and the GPS and the car you're using. That's what you need. Um, specialized training. I don't think the military even teaches the type of tactic that we're talking about. Um, probably the last people to effectively use it would be the uh, some of the Viet Cong in Vietnam, you know, uh, were, were pretty good at thinking out. Well, they usually didn't get away, though. They were almost suicide missions. But if we go to the Maquis in France in World War II, we're probably getting back to where large numbers of people with just about no training uh, were able to cause massive damage to the, uh, the, the German forces in France uh, w without the training. So why would you need training if you've got a mind that can think? And if you did want the training, where would you get it? Go down to the police academy and, hey, I want to learn how to do this. Can you help me? I don't think it would be a good start. And also, if you did have any training that was close to it, uh, military or otherwise, it might get you on a list. So, uh, you know, the, if you've had, um, say, subversive operations training in the military, uh, it might get you on the list. That's where distance becomes very important because you don't want to be within that 300-mile radius if that's the case. Uh, so that any professional training might be recognized by itself uh, as uh, a possibility that would lead to you. Is it necessary to wait until all conditions for making a restoration of the Constitution exist? No, the waiting time's passed. What's surprising is we haven't acted yet. Um, Patrick Henry talked about uh, 
petitions and remonstrances and, and why are we waiting is basically what he said. I suggest everybody go back and read Patrick Henry's uh, March 23rd, 1775 uh, speech. Uh, the longer we wait, the str- as he said, there, uh, if we wait long enough, there's going to be a British soldier in every home. It can only get worse for us. Uh, the conditions are what we make of them. The conditions are what we're willing to work under. Nobody's ever got the perfect conditions for war. You never know what's on the other side until you get there. But when they're getting worse, and now remember this fear is predicated on, if we do that, it's going to get worse. But we're not going to do that. Some nut's going to go do it, and it's going to get worse. So we're not even causing it to get worse. We're allowing it to get worse without our active participation in it. And when we begin to turn it, it will begin getting better the first time we, from the first initiative action that we take, each subsequent action will make it better and better for us. But right now, it will continue to get worse and worse and worse. So as far as all conditions for making, uh, being ideal for making restoration of constitutional government work, that will never happen. Yeah, Gary, you're making it sound as if the, uh, <laughs> as if the, uh, some people within the Patriot community are acquiescing to our overall situation. If you want an excuse, any excuse is good enough, isn't it? If you want to restore constitutional government, there's only one thing that will restore constitutional government, and that's action on our part to the extent necessary. And to the extent necessary, if you think about it, that's a lot. That's the only way we're going to get it back. The advantage is better for us today than it will be tomorrow. Let's go back to a Chinese proverb that I told Randy a long time ago, and Randy loves it. I think he mentioned it on nearly every show he ever did. Uh, When is the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. When is the second best time to plant a tree? Today. The sooner we act, the sooner we who survive the event will realize that we have restored constitutional government to this country. The longer we wait, hey, we might die of old age, never have the opportunity because we never did anything. The conditions will never get better than they are now unless we make them better. We can make them better by doing what's another necessary for us to bring more people into sympathy with our cause, whether it's an active participation or just a mild sympathy. It's necessary, but that improves the conditions because who knows? You might be fleeing sometime and some guy that never was going to get involved says, did you have something to do with that down there? And you say, yes, come on, here, get in my house quick and I'll drive your car down the road for you and park it somewhere, walk back to the house. No telling what's going to happen when we start getting sympathy of people on our side. There's a lady on uh, RTR a few years ago and she contacted me and she said, what can I do to help? And I talked with her a little bit, and uh, she's older, and she's not very mobile. She doesn't have a whole lot of money. And I said, are you willing to hide people if they need hiding? She said, yes. I said, you've got a role that you can play. Everybody that's willing to help us has a role that they can play. It might not be with a, uh, a rifle or, or carrying out some event uh, that we're, like we're talking about. And we haven't gotten into specifics of events, and I don't think we need to in this program. Uh, but there's uh, the military, about uh, less than 20% of the soldiers in Vietnam were active combat. The other 80% were support. Likewise, we need the same uh, or similar ratios in this country. Now, there's the people with bravado that have equipped themselves with the equipment to carry out the deeds that need to be done. So they have stepped forward by those purchases and their bravado. They have stepped forward already and said, I'm the one to do that type of activity. So those people that have that bravado need to realize and step forward and use that expensive stuff that you've got 
and, and trained on and don't you know, not for paintball in the woods, but for restoration of constitutional government. Shooting red paintballs at trees will not restore the government. Does the rampant fear of teasing the government by taking the initiative consistent with part one of the plan? Well, you call it teasing. Let me use the word I used in the plan, aggravation. We're aggravating them. We're thorn, uh, a burr under the saddle. And as we talked about before, we're, we're trying two things, the, uh, the two principal objectives. There are a lot of lesser ones, uh, uh, but they would be more target-specific. Uh, one is uh, acquiring sympathy for people understanding why things are happening, and the other one is putting fear in government. How many uh, incumbents would there be running for office if half the incumbents in office died of lead poisoning? <laughs> yeah, I think I see your point. As in the uh, Matt Bracken article, uh, I think it's something like w what happens after the coup. Um, would the press start getting honest if the dishonest press people started getting sudden cases of lead poisoning? So, you know, the, the, the two things. One is, is the, the public relations, getting sympath, uh, people sympathetic or at least not critical of the activity, doing our best to keep people moving towards or staying stationary but not moving away from us. Now, there's always some that are going to move away because to them, you know, not only do they bend, bend over, they spread their cheeks. Uh, the other one is, is instilling fear in government. What part of government? The police? The, the press? They're part of the government. Face it. That's reality. Uh, the legislatures, uh, the administrative agencies, Internal Revenue Service, you know, they have people collecting money, uh, closing, getting, uh, do, doing these nasty deeds that they do if, if there was risk to that. If you found out they were going to do a, uh, they were going to take somebody's property 300 miles away, that would be an ideal place to go uh, find a little place in the woods. And those guys with those, you know, those little telescopes on top of their rifles get a couple hundred yards away in the woods and uh, stop the activity. After a while, would IRS agents be willing to go see somebody's house or property? Creates a... A chilling effect of sorts. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think... Gary, a, a lot of what we're broaching tonight, uh, I guess you could say kind of dovetails in with really what is, you know, guerrilla warfare theory. And anybody who studied it would understand that there is, it's not necessary to just wait around until all conditions for a serious effort exist because initial actions can create those conditions. And unfortunately, I think a lot of what uh, some of the excuses that uh, you and I and others are unfortunately all too familiar with are or is, um, I guess, a def really what is a defeatist attitude of pseudo revolutionaries who just want to take refuge in the pretext that against a professional army, nothing can be done. And they just want to sit down and wait until, you know, idyllic conditions that will never arrive just plop in their lap without actually working to accelerate them. Well, let's see if the question will answer that question. If the Army started showing up, I don't mean National Guard, but the Army itself started showing up, helicopters, tanks, and everything, uh, running through our sta streets, who would that serve best, us or the government? I wouldn't, I mean, I'm just going to take a stab in the dark, but wouldn't that help our side because that would be technically a crackdown? I would, uh, I would be inclined to believe that way. I, you know, I, I live with that understanding that people, you can push them so far. Uh, Hitler pushed very slowly and eventually got everybody on his side. The government's pushing very slowly in hopes to eventually get everybody on their side. Back to Patrick Henry. The sooner we act, 
and realize that there is a war going on right now, but it's just not shooting war, uh, the uh, the better chance we have to stem that flow of uh, fleeing towards the security of government. Now, as far as uh, guerrilla warfare, uh, I don't know if these small teams really constitute guerrilla warfare as I understand it. You could say the Marquis was practicing guerrilla warfare in World War II in France, uh, and yes, they did have networks that co connected the various bodies, and, and if it was large operation, groups would come together. The Viet Cong uh, practiced guerrilla warfare, and they were part of a network. Now, part two of the plan perhaps steps into that area. Part one of the plan is people knowing that they are breaking the law and uh, being willing to accept the moral consequences of their acts, and that comes to target selection. Uh, they're just independent bodies creating aggravation. Part two of the plan is when, uh, just like Peter Chernoff and, and Paul Fada found places to hide, eventually you find others that are uh, players and have already played in the game of individual aggravation. Now we begin forming a network and something that might be uh, called guerrilla warfare because it is a more coordinated effort rather than individual, uh, apparently random acts. So we step into guerrilla when it escalates to the point that our communication and our uh, uh, security and our comfort levels and everything else have gotten to the point that we can begin acting in concert with others to have even more effective uh, consequences both in the press and in the fear of the, on the side of government. So I wouldn't call it guerrilla warfare at first because it's, let's be honest, it's criminal activity. But it's people that are willing to conduct that criminal activity to initiate act, uh, a broadening of that activity to the point that it becomes an effective war against uh, the, those in power in restoration of constitutional government. And I'm going to return to Tim McVeigh. In my communication with Tim McVeigh in the last few months of his life and what I've read of what he said and confirmation I've gotten from people that did talk to him, he did honestly believe that he was going to get the ball rolling. Somehow, through fear on our side, we, disal we stopped that ball right away. We put it in sand. It couldn't roll any further. Uh, I wrote an a interview with Michael Fortier. It's a fiction, but that got, went to McVeigh, and it was one of the things that he said close, real close about. And I think that uh, uh, what they expected to happen didn't, and, and Tim was very disappointed because he gave his life to start a war of restoration of constitutional government, and it was to no avail. He was not recognized as a martyr, rather being uh, accused of being one of the enemy. That would be very disconcerting, wouldn't it? So we've got to avoid what I refer to as the McVeigh syndrome in doing this. We've got to look very uh, consciously as if people are acting against the government, we should first assume that they're on our side and we're on their side. And if they did something we wouldn't have done ourselves, and I go back to McVeigh again, I wouldn't have done it in the daytime. I think he was wrong in doing that, but I still support him because he had to make a decision. He didn't consult with me. I didn't consult with him. We cannot damn somebody because we object to their tactic because if we do, we will stay, stay so divided that we will never accomplish anything. We have to accept that if they're fighting our enemy, then they are on our side. Well, in terms of criminality, um, obviously that's, you know, th those are things that would be considered, you know, mala and, or excuse me, mala prohibita, at least by the enemy rebel government. And I think it would behoove everyone to really look into their own hearts and just try and uh, determine what they would consider to be, uh, you know, morally acceptable and to take responsibility for those decisions. Well, I don't think that... Uh giving somebody a case of lead poisoning in the middle of the night or destroying some uh, uh, corporate property uh, is mala prohibita. I'm not sure. I think that's definitely got an injured party. Um, 
So I don't think mal prohibit is a factor here. I think that uh, somebody with the guts. Now, I've been trying to compile a list, but there were a number of events before Lexington and Con Concord where people actually died. Uh, they were illegal acts. They were, if the people were caught, things would have happened to them. Uh, in fact, there were some where it was just destruction of property, and if the people were caught, there would have been consequences to them. Houses being torn down, offices being torn down, uh, cannon powder and, and shot being stolen uh, from forts. Uh, a lot of things happened, and people died as a consequence. The, uh, at this point in, in the research, the greatest number of deaths, I can account for seven deaths, as a consequence of tarring and feathering. Whether any were shot, I haven't run across it yet, but you know, those aren't the things that people like to talk about, and it's just hard to find them. This is before April 19th, by the way. Uh, but definitely, those people that stood on Lexington Green uh, on April 19th, 1775, were breaking the law by trying to stop the British troops. And those that fired their guns were breaking the law by trying to kill British troops. And subsequently, uh, at Concord, uh, at Northbridge, those people that shot the British soldiers were breaking the law. The war hadn't started yet. You could say the war actually started when the British were retreating and were just outside of Concord and there were uh, hills on both sides of the road and they had to cross, they had to narrow their troop forces to go across a narrow bridge and some firing began down by that bridge, not North Bridge, but another bridge. Firing began down there and then it became open game. And from then on, that's when the war started. Anything done before that was an illegal act. Face it. Well, while it well while it may be illegal, you know, just because something is illegal does not necessarily mean that it, it is also immoral. And unfortunately, as we've seen from the tyranny of the enemy rebel government, um, they seem to take pleasure in uh, in <laughs> in trying to make it appear as if it's you know mala and say, but of course that's far from the case, especially when you consider the ba the bailouts and many many other things that they do. The federal government has no jurisdiction in Waco, Texas. I mean, that was uh, appalling there. Uh, but, but yeah, and that's why in in the plan, in the introduction, I talk about tar target selection, and, and you better be careful if you're going to do something. When you select your target, that you are morally in your own mind justified because you will have to live the rest of your life with the knowledge that you committed that illegal act. And until it becomes... Game on, which happened as the British were leaving Concord, when it finally became game on. Uh, anything prior to that would be considered criminal activity rather than an act of war. Right. So, consequences. No, I don't think people uh, really sweated over the fact that they killed a few British soldiers and then a few more before it was game on. Uh, they felt justified in, in defense of their property or whatever. But the war didn't start until it became en masse. Everything, everybody was shooting at everybody. And that's where we are. And it's going to take a lot longer to get to that point because they didn't have radios, they didn't have helicopters, they didn't have cameras on the roadsides, they didn't have all the things that technology has given the government and in many cases denied us in this country. They didn't have drones in the sky. Uh, so we've got to deal on the modern playing field and understand that if we do what the framers did, exactly what they did, however, and that's destruction of property, uh, killing people by trying and feathering at least, uh, one British soldier was shot at one point when they were stealing cannon and gunpowder from, uh, I can't remember the place right now. He wasn't killed. But these were illegal acts. But if we're going to perform those same illegal acts, we couldn't do it. You couldn't turn and fear there's somebody and parade him down the street, main streets of Boston nowadays. You couldn't even get in his house because when they saw you, uh, when he saw you coming, and assuming he would be on the side of government, he would make a phone call, and the cops would grab everybody in the kept crowd and beat them to a pulp. So the playing field has changed. So what we have to do is take the events the founders conducted, the activities the founders conducted, but and it it it's a greater risk to them because 
of technology because we have to do it in a, a manner in which we're not exposing ourselves and not giving up the game when we go to play it by being subversive in our activity or covert, I should say, very covert in our activity. And it has to be more severe. Since we can't tar and feather him, we give him lead poisoning. So time has changed. But the events that lead up to that, those illegal acts, have to be done with the least risk of getting arrested as they uh, were back then. Nobody would testify back then, but now they have cameras and people would testify. There's not the same sympathy. Uh, that there was in Boston, which is where most of this was occurring, because the troops had already invaded Boston by the, the time a lot of this happened. But the uh, the change playing field has to change our tactics, but our objectives have to be predicated on the same types of objectives the Founding Father had, uh, which are illegal acts, but morally justifiable. But make sure they're moral morally justifiable. Don't pick a cop because you don't like him. Pick a cop because of what he did. And there's proof of what he did. And when that circuitous route gets that information back to the alternate media and they publish it and show the YouTube video of him beating this girl's head into the ground or something like that, there's a moral justification there. Some people won't grasp it, but some will. But at least there's something to grasp when we can provide the evidence, whether it be a newspaper article, uh, a cell phone video, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as there's something that can be grasped to justify it. Right, and it's very, very important throughout all of this that we uh, maintain the moral high ground or else, in a lot of ways, the effort is lost. And uh, if more people kind of kept that in mind, we'd be farther uh, a lot longer, farther ahead in restoring constitutional government and securing our liberties, that's for certain. Well, Gary, I'd like to thank you for coming on this evening and uh, kind of clearing up some uh, unfortunate misconceptions that have been spreading around uh, the alternative media, so I appreciate it. Well, thank you for inviting me once again, Sleepy, and uh, to the listening audience, have a good evening. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, everyone, that's going to conclude this. That's going to conclude this episode of OPF Radio. Uh, join us for our next broadcast two weeks from today on Monday, March 18th, where we will learn how to talk to a cop if you want to. Be free and stay free, everyone. Good night. I had a dream the other night that, well, I didn't understand. A figure walked in through the mist with a flintlock in his hand. His clothes were torn and dirty as he stood there by my bed. He took off his three-cornered hat and speaking low to me, he said, We fought a revolution to secure our liberty. We wrote the Constitution as a shield from tyranny. For future generations, this legacy we gave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. The freedoms we secured for you, we hoped you'd always keep. But tyrants labored endlessly while your parents were asleep. Your freedom's gone, your courage lost, you're no more than a slave. In this, the land of the free and home of the brave. You buy permits to travel and permits to own a gun. Permits to start a business or to build a place for one. On land that you believe you own, you pay a yearly rent. Although you have no voice in saying how the money's spent. Your children must attend a school that doesn't educate. And your Christian values can't be taught according to the state. You read about the current news in a regulated press. And you pay a tax you do not owe to please the IRS. Your money is no longer made of silver nor of gold. You trade your wealth for paper so your life can be controlled. You pay for crimes that make our nation turn from God and shame. You've taken Satan's number. You've traded in your name. You've given government control to those who do you harm so they could burn down churches and seize the family farm and keep our country deep in debt. Put men of God in jail. Harass your fellow countrymen while corrupted courts prevail. 
Your public servants don't uphold the solemn oaths they've sworn. And your daughters visit doctors so their children won't be born. Your leaders send artillery and guns to foreign shores and send your sons to slaughter fighting other people's wars. Can you regain the freedoms for which we fought and died? Or don't you have the courage or the faith to stand with pride? And are there no more values for which you'll fight to save? Or do you wish your children to live in fear and be a slave? Oh, sons of the Republic, arise. Take a stand. Defend the Constitution, the supreme law of the land. Preserve our great Republic and each God-given right. And pray to God to keep the torch of freedom burning bright. As I awoke, he'd vanished in the mist from whence he came. His words were true. We are not free, but we have ourselves to blame. For even now as tyrants trample each God-given right, we only watch and tremble, too afraid to stand and fight. If he stood by your bedside in a dream while you were asleep and wondered what remains of the freedoms he'd fought to keep, what would be your answer if he called out from the grave? Is this still the land of the free and home of the